behalf of Southern University Law Center and in conjunction with the congregation B'nai Israel, I welcome you to the Rosenwald movie live panel discussion and q and I will serve as your moderator tonight. I am Torrance Bernetta 2L here at SULC. And without further ado, I will allow our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. I'll start with Rabbi Appel. Hi, I'm Rabbi Appel. I am the interim rabbi currently at Congregation B'nai Israel here in Baton Rouge. And I am delighted to be part of this panel um, and um, just happy to be participating. I served for a time in Hyde Park, Chicago. So I know a little bit of the areas that are mentioned in the documentary. And um, Peter Askely, who is Julius Rosenwald's grandson and biographer was one of my congregants at the time. So I'm just delighted to be here. Okay, thank you very much for that. I, I seem to be having some type of technical difficulty. So hopefully it's okay for everyone else. Um, Next, we shall uh, hear from Director Kipner. Yeah, my name's Aviva Kepner. I live in Washington, DC. Uh, I directed and wrote and produced the movie. Uh, several, uh, about 15 years ago, I was on Martha's Vineyard and I attended a lecture called Blacks and Jews. And I went to it because I thought it was gonna be about the civil rights era. Uh, one person speaking was Rabbi David Saperstein, who I knew already, who was very involved in Reform Judaism. And the second person was one of my heroes who I had not met up until then, and that was the civil rights activist, Julian Bond. And that night, Julian started talking about Rosenwald and his relationship with Booker T and building the schools and the fellowships of which his, Julian's father and uncle also got fellowships. And a flashball went off in my head and I said, that's the film I have to make. And uh, thanks to the organizing of the Southern University Law Center and B'nai Israel joining in with us, um, I wanted very much to show this film. It has had a commercial release, but we wanted to get it even more so, and especially in the South. So the Kellogg Foundation has been generous enough to sponsor these screenings all around the country. And so, here we are tonight. Thank you so much. It's a it's a phenomenal film, and um, I think anyone who's had the opportunity to see it gets a lot out of it. And um, hopefully, this message keeps moving throughout. Um, last but certainly not least, we will hear from Chancellor Pierre. Good evening. What a pleasure to be here. I have such wonderful feelings this evening because Aviva Kempner has really blessed us with her beautiful work. And Rabbi Appel has uh, blessed us with her appearance with us. Um, there's such a rich history between American Jews and African Americans in this country, particularly in the South. That could be stories told over and over and over again about that relationship that is so rich. And we don't tell those stories enough. And we sometimes don't understand the importance of those relationships and those interactions. So I hope this evening we will be able to discuss a very important topic related to the work of Julius Rosenwald. When I found out that it was available, I just started pursuing it. And I just said, wow, we got to tell, we got to have folks learn about this story. Uh, and I've used information about Julius Rosenwald in education law classes that I've been a guest lecturer of. And it's amazing how many people do not know the story of Julius Rosenwald and his impact on education in the South, African American. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Um, so let's just hop right into it. Um, Rabbi, my first question is for you. One of the underpinnings mentioned in the film was the principal, and forgive me if I mess this up, uh, Tikkun Olam. And um, it went through the film 
And so talk to us about that principle and how you believe it, it may have inspired Rosenwald. So you did just fine um, in terms of the pronunciation. Good job. Tikkun Olam is a very interesting um, concept that is undergirds many things in Reform Judaism. And it has to do with this idea of being partners with God in repairing the world and in bringing things to the way that they should be. There's a whole long description of what it is that we're repairing, but in essence, we're trying to reunite things that have been separated and to bring them to a higher state. And that can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done through the way that we treat other people. It can be done through the way that we act in the world. And the work that Julius Rosenwald did on so many levels was tikkun olam, repairing what needed to be repaired. And what he saw um, was uh, what he saw that was broken and what he saw that he could do. The other basic concept that I would say that undergirds his work is the concept of tzedakah which is from the Hebrew root tzedek, which means justice. And it is a principle that we should give our time and our money in a way that is just, and that we're required to do that on a regular basis. So um, that's tikkun olam and tzedakah. Very beautiful, beautiful concepts. That leads me to my next question for you. Um, it's, it's safe to assume that Rosenwald's um, philanthropy was faith-based. And so if that's a correct assumption, would you think that his example uh, could serve as an inspirational roadmap for others to engage in faith-based giving? So I would say that what he did was based on his faith. Um, and I, again, would use the word sadaka rather than philanthropy, even though he might have used the word philanthropy, because words like charity, which comes from the Latin caritas, and philanthropy, which means love of your fellow human being, um, come out of sort of, oh, you're, you're, you're doing it at, impelled by an emotion. And sadaka is impelled by justice. You need to right what is wrong. And I would say he was definitely um, impelled by the Judaism of his time, by the example of his rabbi to use his resources and to enact the change that needed to happen. Um, I would say that he also um, saw the parallels between um, what was happening in Europe and what was happening here in the United States and felt as if he were, if he was helping over there, he needed to be helping over here in a situation that was very similar. So I would say that it was definitely faith-based and I would say that it was definitely um, a model of what we can do. I don't know that we can each give away a third of our incomes um, nor are we expected to, but he certainly was a model of planning his giving, investigating what he was going to do and making sure that he was doing, you know, something that would have impact and, you know, leveraging what he could and getting buy-in from the community to make sure that there was impact. And I think that's, that's really important. Wow. Beautiful. So it, it almost sounds like it was less of an inspiration and, and more of something that he was compelled to do based on his faith. Yes. Great. Can, um, I, can I add something about Rabbi Hirsch? Because I am totally fascinated by him. First of all, he used to lecture on Sundays. Reform Judaism at that time didn't observe Shabbos, Shabbat because a lot of uh, the members were working then, but he would lecture and give these great lectures on Sunday that even non-Jews came and heard. 
And Hirsch, if you look him up, although he was originally from Europe and played football at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, he was one of the original signers of the NAACP. So clearly he had a rabbi, you know, that was very inspiring. But, you know, it was Booker T. Washington himself because uh, someone handed Rosenwald a copy of Up From Slavery. And then reading that book, that's why these biographies or these autobiographies can be so inspiring. And that also, as we say, sort of sealed the deal. And when he had Booker T. Washington come up to Chicago, Booker T. then said to him, well, I'd like you to come see Tuskegee. And what did he do? He brought his family with him and his rabbi. So it's, it's just fascinating to me what inspires people to get involved. And I think it's, you're right, it's faith-based, but it's also need-based. When, you know, when you look around, you can see that even the things he did in Chicago, like building uh, the Michigan Garden Apartments and you know, other things he did that. And he also was very involved in the Jewish community. I just wanted to really concentrate on the Jewish African-American connection in the film. Thank you. You make some very good points, director. And, and originally, I had thought to ask you about what inspired you, but just hearing you talk, let me change the question and ask you basically what compelled you or what need did you see that um, caused you to make this, this documentary? Well, first, it was hearing Julian Bond that day, definitely. And second of all, I grew up in Detroit. I went to an all city school, Cass Tech. It was an integrated school. I always grew up in integrated neighborhoods. My father worked for the poverty program. My father, who was originally from Europe, I was even born in Europe, always talked. I was too young to you know, go South and be in the civil rights movement. But I think there was always something in me, especially about the relationships between blacks and Jews and you know, my career the last 40 years is making films about underknown Jewish heroes, but you know, fighting different isms like fascism in Europe, um, McCarthyism. But this gave me a chance to really fight racism, which to me, you know, is one of the great ills in our country, and to show a different way that it can be done through education, through grants, believing in young artists. I think everything that you see the Rosenwald was involved in the fund, uh, the fund in giving. It, it could be practiced again and again today and make a difference. Phenomenal. While you were filming this, this work, and should I say masterful, because um, as I viewed it, I realized there was so much about the world and even the, the plight of the black community, me being a part of it, I had no idea about. Um, so as you were filming this, um, was there anything that surprised you about the artist Augusta Savage? Uh, um, I'm the daughter of an artist. Uh, my mother was an abstract expressionist painter. So the whole Augusta Savage story is just so compelling to me because she had this magnificent piece Oh, I meant to, I have like a replica of it, but, and she spends, you know, a year making it and has the biggest honor in 1939 at the World's Fair, and she did not have the money to bring it home. So uh, a couple of years back, I wrote a piece to the New York Times calling for, you know, we're talking about statues being removed. And this was even before the Black Lives um, Matter movement uh, took wind. And I must say, I'm very proud. I hope people saw the film towards the end, to, to the end, because I do have um, it dedicated to Black Lives Matter. But in any event, I think we need to replicate her harp and reestablish that. And the Ford Foundation under Darren Walker um, made sure that there was a study done about the feasibility and different people are talking about re redoing the statue again and putting it in different places. So it isn't always about removing or destroying statues. I think it's also bringing back something that was so moving and so ahead of their times. I mean, she was such an important artist. So I'm hoping that's going to happen. Continue on with that. Tell us about the link between the film and a famous law school civil rights case. 
Um, well, actually, it, it, it's, it, it's a, a cute story because you see footage of the schools in the film. And I started looking for the you know, footage of any schools at that period of young African-American kids. And it turns out some of the footage was taken by Charles Hamilton, <clears throat> who was the head at one time of Howard Law School, but was the protege of Thurgood Marshall, who of course did the very famous uh, education uh, board versus I, I'm not remembering exactly the, the type of the very famous desegregation case. So here you have a lawyer who's working with Thurgood and what does he do? He takes footage himself. And you know, I, I look at what happened with the horrible killing of Floyd. It, it's the camera today, the iPhone today, that's what we were doing, uh, you know, people were doing decades ago to, to, to bear witness to uh, the schools and you know, how they were unequal. I wish someone would write a movie or a book, make a movie or write a book about exactly how that footage was taken. Cause I, th I think it's very interesting. Wow, profound. So Chancellor, let's, let's move to you. Um, discuss how Rosenwald's contributions serve as uh, one of the precursors to higher learning advancement for the black community, or more specifically, uh, how his contributions serve as a forerunner for the creation of a school like SULC? Well, what Mr. Rosenwald did was he had relationships with some of the leading thinkers uh, in the black community. I mean, obviously he was in his day what we would consider to be the Bill Gates of that of that time. So you think about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and what they're trying to do in terms of education and other pieces. So he was that kind of um, mogul, if you want to think about it from that standpoint. So what he was doing was at a critical time after Plessy versus Ferguson. So you have to think about this. In 1896, the Supreme Court, when it ruled about separate but equal, what they did was they disenfranchised a whole group of people who basically could not access things like education, housing, and so forth and so on. And so what he did was that in his partnership with Booker T. Washington, who had formed the Tuskegee Institute, what he did was he created the pipeline for basic education opportunities for African Americans in a way that could essentially get them to propel themselves to further educational success. Now, what you have to recognize is by the time that Julius Rosenwald begins his work, his mighty work, he and Booker T. Washington together only were together for a short period of time because Booker T. Washington died uh, as a young man in 1915. He was only 56 years old when he died, okay? So Rosenwald's work spans a time when in most communities in the South, blacks could not go to any school. So it was, also, it was based upon self-determination. Now, there were African-Americans who were in small communities generating opportunities for themselves to go to school, uh, and that's the basis of the creation of historically black colleges. But what Rosenwald did was he put it on a grander scale. He helped uh, really exponentially grow, and particularly in Louisiana, there were hundreds of schools. There were Rosenwald schools in Louisiana. Louisiana also benefited from another luminary, uh, uh, wealthy woman 
named Catherine Drexel. So when you take the power of Catherine Drexel as a nun who gave up her wealth from the Drexel uh, financial wealth and gave it to, to help educate black kids. And, and now you have Rosenwald using the wealth he has from Sears and Roebuck to build these schools, the combination was powerful because it gave an undergirding for education. In addition to that, he was also very important with respect to the development of Dillard University uh, as, as, a, as a trustee of Dillard University and his philanthropy or gift giving respect to Dillard University. Here's a real significant connection. Xavier University is literally across town from Dillard University. Catherine Drexel creates Xavier University, which is the only historically Black Catholic university in the country. And it's right across town from Dillard University. So we have two institutions that have a connection to uh, each other from one who comes from Jude Judaism and the other from Catholicism. And they're right across from each other. And there was a healthy competition between Xavier University and Dillard University in terms of trying to pr produce graduates uh, that were going to be change agents in this country, change agents. And, and when you look at the legacy of those institutions and the impact of Rosenwald with the one room schools or three room schools, my sister was educated in a Rosenwald school. It's, it, it wasn't but a quarter of a mile from the house. And that building stood there in and in, it was stood there in a pasture until it just essentially Evolved, you know, where it fell. Okay, but and there's still Rosenwald schools still all over, and some people are trying to preserve those schools because they are important historical sites. And what those schools talked about is the partnership between Rosenwald, Rosenwald, and the local Black citizens, because they contributed by either being a labor for the construction of those schools, and then working together from a community standpoint to be able to afford a teacher coming to those schools. And many of those teachers came from Tuskegee because of the model that uh, Booker T. Washington put in where his, his students would go out across the South and be educators in those rural communities based upon that idea of lifting the veil of ignorance putting your bucket where you are and changing things in your own communities. And that's a very powerful statement. One, an example that we could use today uh, that was used a hundred years ago. He was doing the work in the 1920s all the way through the thirties, et cetera, that we could have today, that whole power of self-determination by people leveraging resources and coming together. Absolutely. And I, 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 let me just add one more thing when you mentioned Dillard, because Julius Rosenwald's daughter, Edith Stern, wound up marrying and moving to uh, New Orleans. And she also continued on uh, being very active and supportive to Dillard. And if you ever get to New Orleans, there's a beautiful, uh, her estate is now Museum Longview, and it's right there in New Orleans. And also she was very involved in civil rights as well as hosting a concert for Marian Anderson. So she was very much her father's daughter. And then her grandson runs Equal Justice, which is a, a, a whole, it's a, how would you explain it, uh, Chancellor Pierre? Equal Justice Works is probably the premier public interest organization for, law, for young lawyers who want to get into public interest work. They provide funding and financing for a lot of law students. And we've had law students 
that have become equal justice work fellows. In fact, equal justice work provided the funding to help us develop the disaster legal clinic in 2016 after the great flood in Baton Rouge in 2016. So again, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving and the connections that just keep running over time, transforming the connections. And, and the man wants to David. And in time. Right. So, I mean, so much has happened. Um, such a huge impact. You know, there, there are various Black icons, renowned doctors, lawyers, artists, and such. They all receive Rosenwald grants and fellowships to continue their educations and to produce great contributions. Um, so leads me to my next question and it's open for all, but I'll start with you, Chancellor. What do you think uh, or what type of fortitude or grit as we refer to it here at SEOC, do you believe Rosenwald possessed that allowed him to openly assist black America during the time of Jim Crow? Well, he was a man of great faith. And if you, if you, you have to assume that he was a man of great faith, who was fearless. And so, you know, if you think about the Old Testament and you think about all the great uh, figures in the Old Testament who did not fear anything, uh, they, 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 they believed in their purpose, and they would not be daunted by uh, being ridiculed, if you were, uh, being called names, because he realized he was bigger than that. He had to be a very comfortable man in his skin, very comfortable. He could not be that otherwise, because he was able to deal with any type of ridicule or intimidation or fear. I mean, if you think about it, he had a business in the South that was, everybody knew about Sears and Roebuck in Southern communities, but he wasn't even afraid that folks would not buy his items from Sears and Roebuck because of his assistance to African Americans in the South. So he, he just had to be a man that was great, that had great comfort in himself. He was comfortable in his skin and he had to be a man of great faith and a man of justice. Anybody else wanna add something to that? Well, I think there's an irony. You, if you remember in the film, he left at age 16 from school going to New York to learn business. So I think there's something in him that he never got the full education he should have, although he's a very smart man and a great businessman. So it's sort of ironic that he made provided for education. Um, and I also think, you know, there's a line uh, Congressman John Lewis said, you see something, do something, make good trouble. I just thought, I just think from reading um, up from slavery to seeing, you know, like he would drive from home to the office and he would just see, that those who are coming up from the great migration were living in horrible conditions. And, you know, it was a building for rent, but he, he just wanted to make a difference. He, a difference, partly again, inspired by his rabbi, but, you know, certainly someone who did not mince words. Although I have to say there's one time that I think Booker T very wisely caught him on something. Now, you know, one thing Sears did was develop these um, kid houses. So he thought logically, well, why does it, that should be the schools? And Booker T said, no. He said, they've got to be built in the community. They have to feel it's part of the community. And then we have someone like Robert Taylor, who was one of the first, uh, was the first black architect graduating from MIT, who developed the, the architecture. It was green architecture before we even talked about green architecture. And by the way, it's Robert Taylor's granddaughter, Barbara Bowman, who talks about living in the Michigan Garden Apartments. Do you know who her daughter is? Is Valerie Jarrett, who we know, you know worked closely uh, with President Obama. 
So uh, I just find all these connections so interesting. And of course, a lot of Tuskegee's emphasis was on building. So they could, you know, develop out of there. I mean, I think there, there's so much to learn, even from the way the structures were done. So yeah. I, would, I would say that his resilience came from his faith. I would say that his resilience came from his family. You know, hearing the stories of his father coming to the United States, you know, at a very young age with only $20 in his pocket. Um, you know, all of that would have um, developed resilience and grit. And it sounded as if he also wanted his children to develop that kind of um, resilience as well. At this time, we will uh, switch over and take some questions from the audience. Uh, the first question that I have, and this is open to um, any panelists, um, Trent is asking, why did Mr. Rosenwald decide to bring the foundation to an end and not pass the mantle on to his? Children? Yeah, his, his legacy. You know, every philanthropist has a concept. And for him, Rosenwald was probably the first one to really develop it. And that's spending down. That you spend the money in your lifetime or near after that. It's not that his kids didn't inherit money and also were very generous. It was just how what he believed. And you even see people doing that now. I think there's a, a lot of very wealthy people who are very philanthropic talking about, you know, spending all the money down. It, it was just his belief that that was the way to go. On the other hand, Ford Foundation continued on, which I'm happy about because they pay, we have a study guide that goes with the film. And if you order the, uh, the DVD of the film, we also have four and a half hours of bonus features, including one story that I forgot to mention. I don't know if you, if you all know about Leo Frank, who was um, the Jewish uh, factory owner, or he was running the factory, and he was falsely accused of murdering Mary Fagan, someone who worked in the factory. And while he was waiting to be um, faced trial, uh, people in the North were raising money for his case, including Julius Rosenwald, and he, he was lynched. He was taken out of prison and lynched. And so there was also a lot of fear in the Jewish community at that time, which has to do with the fact that it was great that Rosenwald, you know, although he was living in the North, did not fear because of that reason. Okay. The next question that we have is from uh, David. Um, he asked, uh, could August Salvage's statue be included in one of the sites of the uh, future Julius Rosenwald National Park? Uh, there's a wonderful woman named Dorothy Canner who was inspired by the film and there's a whole campaign to name a park after Julius Rosenwald. I'm sorry, I don't have the website in my, name, uh, in my head, but it, I, I'm hoping they'll succeed. They're doing, and Stephanie Deutsch who's related by marriage to Julius Rosenwald, who wrote a book on uh, Booker T and the relationship with Julius Rosenwald is also involved in that. But I think you should just look up Julius Rosenwald Park and you'll probably find it. Okay. Um, one other question from Trent is, is asking, um, where can we get information on the locations and number of Rosenwald schools built? The National Trust for Historical Preservation has on their website a list, I think there's like a hundred schools that are being restored and it's a wonderful movement. They're all over the South. And if you just go there, you can find out. And you know what's very interesting? Um, I don't know, you, you all living down here may know about it in Louisiana. It's oftentimes people have gone up North for the great migration or their parents did but after they retire, they own land, the family land, and they've come back. And several of the people I interviewed that were involved in restoring the schools 
were the, were people who had retired from the north and came down. So it's really a great story of people having wonderful memories of the schools and oftentimes their community centers, their schools, their museums. So the, the National Trust has a whole section on it. And in, in the local area, um, there is one in St. Gabriel, which is right outside of Baton Rouge. Um, so that's one for sure. You can actually find an interactive a map which shows the locations of the Rosenwald schools throughout Louisiana. Uh, so if you, if you Google uh, Rosenwald schools in Louisiana, or they, they do a box state, but you can see many of the locations where those schools existed and some of them where the actual buildings still there and most of them preserve those buildings. Uh, so there's that clearly one in this local area. And, uh, and that's in St. Gabriel. And when both Julian uh, Bond and I believe when Representative Lewis had their civil rights tours, they would often include visiting one of the restored schools. So um, Trent asked us another question. Um, he wanted to know, were the original Rosenwald schools subsumed into local communities? I, when you say local communities, I, as in part of a school system or just... Uh, I would think um, the uh, audience members probably asking, was it ever really truly kind of accepted and, and, and made part of the already established system? Very rarely. Uh, I think the answer to that would be very rarely. Um, and actually, there's an interesting story about how the school desegregation case actually the East Baton Rouge got started <laughs> because um, Rosenwall, if I'm not mistaken, there was a relationship with Rosenwall and they had some kind of deal with the East Baton Rouge school system where we were going to do a school in for black kids. Um, and somehow or another, because the school was in North Baton Rouge near the old Esso plants, or it was not Exxon Mobil, there was a decision that that school would be built for white kids and would be given to white kids. And black parents had contributed their time and labor to build a school. And that is what led them to file the case called Davis versus East Baton Rouge Parish which turned out to be the longest school desegregation, running school desegregation case in the country. It ran from uh, 1956 to, to 2007. I, mean, I know it very well because I spent about 10 years involved in, in, that, in that litigation of that case. So, um, Trent, if, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to ad lib a little bit on your next question. Um, outside of Booker T. Washington, uh, did Rosenwald, to your knowledge, have any other cohort in the African American community? Outside of Booker T. Washington? Right. Like after he passed, mm -hmm. did he, you know, yeah, there, 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 there were several. Uh, there was Jonas. So Booker T. Washington had a lot of disciples. People who went out to to do the work, um, and and one of them in Louisiana, among the many, was Jonas Barry Henderson, J. B. Henderson. So, uh, the, Mr. Henderson, they developed schools in their communities. Literally, uh, they, were, they were all part of that whole process of going out there and doing stuff in local communities. Uh, there was uh, Charles P. Adams, 
who was born actually in uh, in Brule, Louisiana, who went on to with a group of black farmers with some dollars that were coming from Rosenwald to create uh, what is now Grambling State University. Um, so so yes, there were there were many uh, there were many partnerships because again you must remember that Booker T. Washington died in 1915. And so the work of Rosenwald went way beyond 1915. And so David, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, W.E. Du Bois also got a Rosenwald grant and um, wrote about, especially after Rosenwald passed away, I mean, it was very interesting to me that he, he was supportive of both philosophies that were competing at the time, but he was clearly more involved with uh, Booker T. Okay. So uh, David, a, an audience member has a question and I kind of want to ad lib with that too, but uh, based on all of the, the faith-based and need-based uh, giving and the accomplishments that Ro Rosenwald uh, and Booker T kind of culminated together. Uh, what do you think is being done today to ensure that children are still getting access to the best education that we can afford? Well, there, there are examples. I mean, again, I think you have to look at the Bill and Melinda Gates that's an example of uh, efforts to uh, increase access to education, quality education, to uh, students from underrepresented and minority and low income communities. That, that's, a, that's a primary example. Um, you have others who are doing the same thing. And I think you should. I think, think about uh, more recently, uh, the former spouse of Jeff Bezos, who has contributed a lot of money more recently to historically black colleges and other places that we don't always know. I mean, we know about the public gifts. We don't always know about the, the, the private gifts uh, from that standpoint. So, I mean, those are examples uh, that going on today that I think you can point to. There is um, I think a gentleman in New Jersey uh, who also uh, in um, either Trenton, New Jersey, or or uh, not no, it's a, it's in New Jersey who has contributed lots of money to sort of reform school system and to give young African-American and Latinos opportunities to get access to education and jobs uh, in, in that part of New Jersey. And I, I know Zuckerberg is one who has done some of that work. So you see those kinds of opportunities being created where you have folks individually. Of course, you have uh, a more recent example of LeBron James <laughs> and, and what he has done uh, uh, in Ohio. Akron, yeah. Yeah, so again, so you see those those kinds of opportunities being created, you know, uh, unfortunately too infrequently, but you do see that. So let me kind of go, go to this one area that we haven't touched on tonight. Um, right now, we're in a time of polarizing civil rights events and political events. And I mean, like with the murder of George Floyd and so many others, what do you guys think would be Rosenwald's reaction if he were here to see it today? I think his reaction would have been the same as it was when at the time that he was alive, there was one of the highest rates of lynchings of African Americans going all over the South. I mean, so his reaction would have been to do something. Uh, 
uh, you know, now the, the style in which he would, might do it today versus when he did it, uh, it's interesting that he was doing stuff during a pandemic <laughs> because when you look at what he created, so now we're 100 years, uh, 100 plus years, 102 years, depending on the way you start counting, uh, 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 after the last pandemic, and Julius Rosenwald was doing a, a, a fantastic work um, trying to right the wrongs that existed or trying to equalize things uh, in America. And I think he would be doing the same thing uh, on the same level. Uh, and it just, it's just a matter of, uh, of, of what he would do under what. Maybe he might not have been a vocal outspoken person, but he would have done it with his resources. So, and I think one of the things that I gather from the documentary, I mean, we're talking about somebody who was astounding at management and was able to, you know, make a commercial venture incredibly efficient and incredibly customer oriented and, you know, really amazing marketing and all of that. And he was used to being in control of that. But I got a sense that with all of his philanthropy, at least what was covered, is that he formed partnerships. And he responded to the requests and the needs of each community. He didn't barrel into a community and just say, hey, let's do it this way. And in fact, you know, as, as Aviva said, when Booker T. Washington said to him, no, we're not going to use, you know, the kit structures that come from Sears, even though that could be efficient, because we need to, de we're, we're, we're developing something more here than just building a school. He was willing to, you know, step back and find out what the needs were from the community. He wasn't going to go in and impose what he thought should happen. And he wasn't going to go in and say, well, y'all should be doing X, Y, or Z. That wasn't what he was going to be doing. He wanted to work in collaboration and he wanted to take his cues um, and support what already was there and not take it over. And also the Rosenwald Fund supported artists very early. I mean, they, they saw the talent, but like Jacob Lawrence's, the famous migration series, he was just a young man and Gordon Parks. I mean, you could just go on and on to see all the different artists that he supported. And Maya, well, Maya Angelou went to school. She, um, and, and even, these were you know, young kids, these were elementary schools. And you know, they often talk how those elementary schools are the formative years or when you can really develop a child's intelligence. And what's fascinating to me is they were almost like Montessori schools because oftentimes they were one big room. So you would hear what would be happening in the higher grade and you would get a lot by osmosis. So uh, I just think it's fascinating in terms of um, how they pr provided support on, for unknowns and for people so young. And it really made a difference. Incredible. Um, Rabbi, let me just go back to you real quickly. You made a point about um, his inclination to want to create a partnership rather than taking it over. Uh, do you think this was exhibited in his um, only given one third of the cost needed when the, a lot of people would have said, well, you got the money, just pay for it all. Um, yeah, I would say so. You know, with the, with the YMCA and YWCA's that he built where he only gave one quarter and said, you know, you all will get the rest. And, you know, that created a cohesiveness in the community that he was able to duplicate at scale across the country. Similarly with the schools, 
you know, where he comes up with this plan of I'm going to give one third, you're the black community is going to come up with one third, and the white community is going to come up with one third. And when I heard that initially in the film, it's like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> and then the description of, you know, the money comes from the state boards of education, I was like, okay, that sounds more likely. Um, you know, that also, I think, you know, it, it, you could see it as, you know, building collaboration, building cohesiveness, building community. You could also see it as his way of leveraging the money that he was, that he was given. I mean, 5,357 schools. Oh my God, that's transformative. And, and something should be said about the Jean's teachers. And I'm hoping one day someone will make a movie about them. But, you know, there was this uh, Quaker woman who was very generous and gave, I think, maybe a million dollars. But it was these young African-American women who would go into the communities and live in the communities. Uh, and some of the Rosenwald Fund money was used for schools. Uh, don't underestimate what a great effect those teachers had. I think they should be, you know, really commended. Thank you. I'm glad you pointed that out because the teacher at the Rosenwald School in my little town lived with my mom and, uh, and her family. She, she lived in that, and, and the, the firstborn in our family, uh, she will be 85 in December, who went to that school, benefited immensely from having that teacher live in the house and be able to go to school. That, that, that you know, she now has a PhD in biology. And you have someone like George Wolf, who's this incredible director of both theater and movies. As a matter of fact, they're already talking about the new movie he's doing, uh, Reigns, uh, the, who has the actor that just died, Bossman, is in the film. When he talks both in the movie, uh, but we also have a bonus feature of the joy of going to that Rosenwald school. And, you know, they weren't talked down to, although oftentimes they would have books that weren't the firsthand books, you know, new. But there was, there was just such a pride in learning. And you can see that that, made the difference later on when um, George went into, into the arts. And I think it also made a difference. I, I wish there was more in the film about Representative Lewis because, you know, he talks about, you know, lecturing the chickens when he grew up. But I think the Rosenwald School made a big difference in developing the great leader he became. Rabbi, any final thoughts for us before we close it out? Um, I'm so glad that we have this film to lift him up as an example, to um, you know show the possibilities of collaboration, to show the possibilities of tzedakah, of giving justly, of uh, the importance of, as he said, give while you live, um, as well as you know planning one's giving and determining that one's giving in a place that's going to make a difference and not just responding to the emotion, but actually checking out where it is that you're giving. I was speaking with a friend of mine today and telling her all about the film. And she said, well, you know, you know, people pretty much underestimate the calories that they eat and they overestimate the exercise that they get and they also overestimate the charity that they give, the tzedakah that they give. And I think he's an amazing example for us, even if we don't give at that scale, to be incredibly thoughtful and planned with how we give. Beautiful. Chancellor, any parting thoughts for us? Well, uh, my parting thoughts are, again, I'm just so happy that Aviva Kempner uh, did the film 
and was inspired to do the film and preserve a very important historical life for us to pass on the many generations and give us the opportunity to recognize um, some of the foundational things that we sometimes take for granted, but they weren't so easy to do, but it took incredible people like Rosenwald and a recognition of Rosenwald. And this piece is, is really, truly great. Thank you so much, Chancellor. And Director, your parting thoughts for us. Well, I always say um, we don't all have $62 million to give away, but all of us can find the Julius Rosemont in ourselves to get involved in repairing the world. I feel like that's what my films do. I, I'm now working on a film about the insidious use of Native American mascotting and how it so det detrimentally affects the Native communities. And I think in any of our work, there are things that we can do. Um, and again, you can order a DVD of the film that has four and a half hours of bonus features and you can download the um, study guide in your own home. So it's not too early to start thinking of Hanukkah or Christmas presents. And I think the final thing is just to say, stay safe and make sure you wear a mask. We have some difficult months coming up and we just all have to stay safe. Well, beautiful. I wanna thank each of you for taking time and, and for you, director, for putting this wonderful film together. Um, I learned so much. Um, it's amazing, you know, growing up, I always thought that Sears was just a place to go on a Sunday to look at lawnmowers and washers and dryers and, and to know that it, it, it was being run by someone that really gave so much to the community that I'm, I'm a product of. So it's beautiful. I, I thank you guys and um, that's it. So God bless and good night. Thank you for the honor of being included. Take care. Thanks for organizing this.